Excellent. We are live and absolutely delighted to welcome you to the second of these Trinity Term speaker series. Joining us today is Professor Jim Marone. Uh, James Marone is the John Hazen White Professor of Public Policy and Political Science at Brown University and is visiting here at the Blavatnik School and Nuffield uh, in Oxford for Trinity Term. His second visit to the school yeah. in the last few years. We're delighted to have you back. Um, those of you who have been undergraduates at Brown will undoubtedly know Professor Marone because uh, it is very hard for someone to graduate through Brown and not take his class. He has for the last five years or 10 years or some very, very long period of time uh, taught the most popular undergraduate elective uh, at Brown, which is on city politics. And there's a time when almost a thousand students take the class at the same time. So uh, he is a legend of, of all the Brown graduates who've come through Oxford over the years. We're delighted to have him here. Uh, Professor Marone has written a number of books, 12 in fact, uh, and counting. Uh, and, uh, you know, many of us would love to have our books reviewed in the New York Times, which of course he has, but uh, somewhat unusually and aspirationally, certainly for me, his books have also been reviewed by Playboy. So, <laughs> Just uh, once. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's very, very interesting set of, and, and of course by um, commentators on the political right, indeed. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, his books are widely uh, captivating across the political spectrum, in part because they seamlessly blend um, history, political science, and a deeply pragmatic insight into current affairs. His most recent book is Republic of Roth, um, which I'm holding up here and which Professor Marone has promised to sign over to me on the record uh, at the end of this talk. So do get this book if you are interested in the subject. I'm going to turn it over to Jim now in a moment. He'll speak for about 30 minutes uh, uninterrupted, and then we'll have a chance for questions. And thereafter, we will break for drinks uh, in the forum. Great. Take it away. Oh, thank you. That is a lovely introduction. Uh, Hard to follow up on Playboy, isn't it, uh, on, on an introduction? But I'd like to say how much I've enjoyed being here uh, and at, at Blavatnik again. It is a wonderful place. And if there are any students here, if I can be of any assistance at all at the end, I'll, uh, I'll put up my, my email so you can decide whether or not you feel free, absolutely free to get involved. I'm going to put a timer on to make sure I don't go over this 30 minutes. I'd like to start today with just two images from American politics, and they're the ones that just are filling our heads for those of us uh, who study the United States. And the first, obviously, is this presidential, uh, former president who will not accept defeat. Uh, Donald Trump has sought repeatedly, and for the first time in American history, to overturn a very clear election result, browbeating election officials around the country. And as we pull back from this, there's two different conclusions you can draw, the optimists and the pessimists. The optimists say hey, the system worked. We have this crazy system uh, in the United States of 50 different electoral uh, systems, uh, each one run by its own rules, by its own officials. And yet when the, when, when, when the pressure was on, the 50 different states each held firm. There's uh, Brad Raffensperger, a little known secretary of state in, in the state of Georgia, who sat for an hour and listened to Trump saying, I just need 11,000 votes to overturn Georgia. And this very conservative man calmly says, but you don't have the facts on your side. So a great victory for the system, this ungainly American system. Messy, but it worked. The pessimists say not so fast. What we did in 2020 was crack the system, and now it's in danger of collapsing. That two years later, 71% of Republicans think the, the election was, was stolen. Um, and, you know, I thought, oh, that's just them expressing dissatisfaction. But no, deeper studies that really go into public opinion more carefully suggest they really believe it. Odd how when people say things, they really believe what they say. That 71% is almost the exact same number, by the way, of the people who thought Barack Obama was not an American among Republicans, 72%. So the pessimists go on to say the people like Brad Raffensperger here are under fire 
for doing the election straight. Right now, today, there's an election for this obscure post, Secretary of State of the State of Georgia, and Jody Heiss is challenging Raffensperger on one issue and one issue only. You should have never certified that last election. And the next time, if I'm in office, I'm not certifying. So today, we're going to find out just how rickety the system has become. All over the country, partisans like Jody Heiss are running to take over what had been completely obscure posts, but they're the ones that decide who won the election. And underneath all this, the scary thought that if you actually read the Constitution of the United States, there's no guarantee of a right to vote. It's up to the states. So the deepest fear is that in 2020, we cracked the system, figured out where all those, they cracked the system, figured out where all those um, uh, touch points in the system are. And now those will be up for grabs and taken over and watch the next two or three election cycles for what happens to American democracy. So that's my first introductory snapshot. Let me give you a second one. And this one is really difficult. And that's the, the racial dimension. We have to be aware, if we study American politics at all, of the Buffalo killer last week who killed 10 people just for blackness, basically. And I've laid out there in the middle a series of mass murders, putting aside the individual shooters. There's Mr. Arbery, who was uh, gunned down by three white men of almost in sport. And beyond that, police, there were 1,051 police killings last year in the United States. 1,051, almost the exact same number the year before. And if you're African-American, you're three times as likely, two, more than two and a half times as likely to be a victim of that. Now, these mass shooters, one after another, are explicit about a racial fear that is gripping the United States. I want to talk about uh, gripping cer certain segments of the United States. They, they take their cue from Barrack Tarrant, uh, Brenton Tarrant of New Zealand, who murdered 51 Muslims at a mosque and was very explicit about being fearful that whites are being replaced. This is explicitly, here's the Buffalo killer. This is explicitly what they're saying. We're being replaced. In new, it's, and I want to suggest today that this replacement theory, this crazy conspiracy, reflects history, it reflects demography, and it reflects a kind of crazy paranoia, all wrapped together. In response, by the way, New Zealand banned assault weapons, one dissenting vote in parliament, and 50,000 weapons get handed in within six months. In the United States, nothing. No policy response. Uh, no gun reform, no police reform. On the contrary, uh, many Republicans are now running in the backlash against the backlash to the murders, charging that liberals are brainwashing our children by tell, teaching them that the United States is a racist, racist nation. Today, what I want to do is give you the historical framing, how we came to be where we are today. What's changed to make this situation so difficult for American politics? Why? Why I think it's so perilous. And being an American, Americans are insufferable optimists, as, as many of you have probably encountered uh, at Blavatnik School. I'll end with my reasons to cling to a positive, a positive view. So here's my, um, here's my uh, outline. We've already finished part one. Uh, I want to give you, go back to another book I wrote, the one that was featured in Playboy, um, Hellfire Nation, and just give you a sense of why there's such moral intensity about our politics. Um, just point to five familiar arguments about why things have gotten so angry, then tell you what I think is the real story, make a brief note of inequality, and then give you my um, gesture towards hopefulness. So part two. Sorry, that, those are the chapters of the book. If you want to know about methods and so forth, we can go back to that. The United States comes with a wonderful founding story. And it goes like this. A bunch of Puritans get on a boat in 1630, 12 ships, actually. That's the lead ship, the Arbella, named after the woman who funded the whole enterprise, uh, Lady Arbella. And, uh, 
And these Puritans arrive in the new world and suddenly face a problem. And that is identifying their community. Who are we, they ask. Here, as one of their ministers put it in 1636, here there are no enemies to drive you to heaven. And so they had to define themselves. And what I want to suggest is the Puritan definition of the American self became a kind of metaphor for American politics in a way I'll show you in a minute. So hang on there to this, this very ancient description. They came up with a doozy of an explanation for what the American, uh, American uh, community is. We, they said, are the community of saints, the people preordained by God to live in heaven. They had these rituals for figuring out who was preordained for heaven. If you were de deemed a saint, you could vote. You could um, hold office. You had full membership in the church. You could take communion. By the standards of the day, it was an incredibly democratic place if you could prove you were a saint. And they had ways to prove. Most people, of course, and all women, were, well, we don't know where you stand. And so you were meant to follow the saints. And then there are those people you were pretty sure were going the other way. And uh, those people had to be driven off. The um, heretics, there's Anne Hutchinson, who driven to Rhode Island, where I now teach. The witches uh, piling rocks under which the Native Americans, the Indians who were uh, massacred as agents of Satan. Here's the metaphor. Moral standing defines leadership allocates privileges like the vote, delineates the community and tells us who they are, the people who have to be driven off. And finally, I'm almost done with the Puritans, two dynamite twists. First dynamite twist, John Winthrop sailing to this new world, the first governor reelected 30 times, um, gave what is probably the most famous sermon in American history, repeated over and over again. Ronald Reagan couldn't stop repeating it. We shall be, he said, as a city on the hill, or eyes of all people upon us. Now, the complete chutzpah, as we say in New York, is ridiculous. No one cared about these people. They were, uh, uh, the Puritans, as, as most of you will know, were uh, members of the Church of England that thought the Church of England had sinned by not breaking with Catholicism enough. And they wanted to set up a Puritan, a uh, biblical commonwealth. So here are these people who think the eyes of all people are upon them, which, raises the stakes for all politics. And if you repeat this often enough, you just see it running right through American history. George Washington, the first president, both as, in his inaugural and in his farewell, basically repeats this speech. We are the model of all mankind. Why, if you read through American wars, you see this notion of the moral nation, the model of all mankind, which, which licenses all kinds of behavior. And secondly, and even more, oops, and even more intense, immigrants. Immigrants start coming to the city on a hill. The first rules about immigration are in 1636, and the newcomers stream in. It's an extraordinary diverse nation, the United States, as a result of the different immigrants. We're the models for all mankind, but how about the French, or the Irish Catholics, or the Chinese, or the Jews, or the Italians, or the Latinos, or the Muslims, over and over again. The same charges get, get, get hurled. These people won't assimilate. These people are not like us. These people will ruin, um, uh, will ruin the country. And that sense, constant immigration and fear of immigrants keeps American culture wars roiling. Let me illustrate exactly how this plays out. We'll get out of this deep history in uh, contemporary American politics. I'm going to uh, indulge in an anecdote, if you don't mind, to just illustrate the depth of this. Some years ago, Senator John Chafee of Rhode Island, Rhode Island's a small state, you have trouble finding people to debate. So he, he tapped me and said, let's have a debate about healthcare. Uh, you take the government view and I'll take the market view. He's a really good guy, Chafee. Uh, and so we had a series of debates. And in the first one at Rhode Island College, I was killing. I was just destroying him, and not, as you'll see in a moment, because I'm a better debater, but because the entire audience was made up of college students who are way to the left, and every time we talked, they'd practically hiss. And in the background, there was an old fellow, a big shock of gray hair, a bit hard of hearing, and uh, he would turn to a political science, he was standing in the back, and he would turn to a political science professor every time the senator talked, and he'd say, that's bull, very loud. 
Uh, he used two syllables. I won't repeat the second syllable because we go online and they told me not to, but just imagine the second, you know, what makes the grass grow green and stuff. Um, he just kept saying, no, it's bull. And it made it hard to sort of make the points in favor of the market. And right near the end of the debate, the senator turned to me and said, Professor, you know, when they call you professor, you're in trouble. The mudslinging has begun. Jim is fine. Um, he said, professor, this isn't going to work. You can't ask the hardworking people in the suburbs to go into the same insurance pool as the crackheads in the city of Chicago. And I turned to my people to turn away this. Uh, and, and, and also uh, unwed mothers in the city of Chicago. And I thought, well, this is a fatuous distinction, suburb city. And all the people like, oh, yeah. With a deft flip of the wrist, he said, we're not a single community. We're us, good people, hardworking people, and them. He didn't have to use the word black. He just said crackhead. And all anybody wanted to talk about after the debate was, yeah, what, what, what are we going to do about that? How can we have national health insurance? Which is to say that us and them in America are constantly up for negotiation. They're most intense about race and immigration, our great culture wars. And morality gives it a particular intensity. We're good people, but we're not sure about them. And that, that idea, that image is what the parties have for the first time mobilized today. American politics is so crazy today, so wild, so intense, because the parties have mobilized the sense in a way I'll explain in a minute. Ah, sorry, I went backwards inadvertently. All right heavy partisanship. And the striking thing about party difference is how it explains so much. Look at this chart. If I, you tell me your race, your religious attendance, your gender, your education, it'll explain this is a chart of 10 values. Every year, Pew comes out with this and the, it just keeps going through the roof. If I know your party, I can explain more about you than anything else you can say. Two sides in America, uh, just a few words about the divisions. They live completely separated from one another. Enormous negative partisanship. They trade slurs. Democrats consider Republicans closed-minded and dis dishonest. Republicans trade, uh, trade the same slur I have here. Uh, Joe Wilson, who screams at Obaca, uh, Bar President Barack Obama, you lie, while he's giving a speech. And what he was talking about was Obama's claim that illegal immigrants would not get health benefits under Obamacare, always the same health, uh, same um, immigration and race. Uh, my favorite statistic is uh, up from 3%. Now, 70% plus of Democrats and Republicans would be very upset if their child married across the party aisle. Why so partisan? Well, there's a bunch of usual explanations and I won't go into them. We can talk about them in the Q&A, um, but I'll just mention one of them. Um, and that's the close elections. American politics is at a very dramatic moment in that the elections are unprecedentedly, is that a word, close. So that if you look over the, since 2000, either the House, the Senate, or the, White, the lower house, the upper house, and the, and the White House, have flipped 12 times. That's in 20 years, that's unprecedented. So it is in neither party's interest to cooperate. Each party can win it all the next time. And that's a recipe for really treating the other side badly. So there's five uh, hyperpartisan media, Gingrich rules, which basically I could tell you more about it later, but it basically says take no prisoners. But I wanna give you my explanation and it, comes down to the tribal politics. And what I will do in the next few minutes is give you the traditional pattern of uh, politics in America, of the party politics in America, tell you about the time the parties threw off culture wars, they wanted nothing to do with it, and then how, when the culture wars came back, the parties had reorganized. And remember a point I've already made, these are various racist, uh, not racist cartoons, uh, uh, nativist cartoons and the lamentation of what happens after the Civil War, the level of violence. But again, a case we can talk about in the Q&A if you like, uh, but a case I make in the book repeatedly, that I think the culture wars really turn again and again 
on race and immigration. So what's very interesting about this race and immigration as the parties played it out is this. Each party took the side of another marginal group throughout American history. The more conservative party embraced, or at least were liberal towards by the standards of the day, African-Americans. The Republican party was the party of Lincoln, the party of the Civil War. The Democrat, uh, on the other hand, there were always nativists. They, they hated the Republicans, did the immigrants. The Democratic Party, just the opposite. Let me illustrate this with the very first uh, election campaign, briefly going back, he's trouble with historians, right? They always wanna do this ancient historical stuff. There's Adams and Jefferson in the, in the first campaign. Adams administration, hey, they are contesting 1800. Um, Adams famously feared the immigrants. They created a series of laws, uh, the Alien Acts, which they uh, stole from England, and allowed them to deport dangerous foreigners. Uh, Rob Lieberman is here. His book also includes this uh, marvelous chapter, Four Threats, a book I will recommend now that mine's already uh, on, the, on the shelf. Uh, the Democrats wanted to let, um, let the immigrants vote before they'd even recovered from the sea voyage. You're seasick, but hey, come vote for us. Uh, but what's not so known is what was very loud in this election of 1800 is the revolution in Haiti. The revolutionaries in Haiti drive off their masters, fight off the uh, Spanish, the English, and then the French, and the Adams administration actually helped them out. Adams administration made a treaty with Toussaint, uh, with Toussaint and, um, and actually shelled one of his enemies who sent three ships over, and they were exchanging gifts and so forth. The, Conservative Party, the future Republicans, they were the Federalists then, um, they, on a party line vote, accepted this uh, treaty with Tucson. They pushed it through. The Jeffersonians, the Democrats, were horrified. Jefferson says, what happens when ships come from Haiti with black crews and they see our slaves and our slaves see them? They'll be slave rebellion. And sure enough, during the election, there's Gabriel's election, uh, Gabriel's re uh, rebellion in Virginia, a, a slave rebellion. Um, Jefferson says, Toussaint gets gifts. Gabriel gets hung, but they've done the same thing. And it's, it's the Whigs' fault. So basic point, I'm getting carried away with the history. I apologize, I just do this. Um, the Conservative Party, Feds, Whigs, Republicans, just think of them as Republicans, harshly regulate immigrants, always trying to keep them from voting. but really by the standards of the day, reach out to, um, to, to black people. And the Democrats, just the reverse, uh, push for immigrants, try to get them voting, but they are the primary party of slavery and white, uh, white privilege. So here's an 1876 cartoon. You can see Irish and African-Americans in equipose uh, on the scales of civilization. But hey, we, our party has one group, your party has another group, and then it all changes. Starting about 1900, both parties said enough of this, and they kind of did a deal. It starts with, Teddy, uh, with Theodore Roosevelt in 1801, inviting uh, Booker T. Washington, a very celebrated, very moderate uh, black leader, and he invites him to the White House for dinner. There is an enormous outcry. Senator Tillman, I've, I've cleaned up all the language, but as you can imagine, the racial slurs, we shall have to kill a thousand of them to get them back in their place. Sit this on the floor of the, of the Senate. We'll have to kill them by the thousand to get them back in their place. Such an outcry. No black person is invited back into the White House for 30 years. Um, there was this racist ditty that ran in a lot of the Southern newspapers. Says, These are the only four lines I could quote. Um, but interesting, the last four lines, I see no way to settle it just as clear as water. Let Mr. Booker Washington marry Teddy's daughter. He comes for dinner, but immediately there's thought about sexuality. That is, we're worried about the white race. And if our children marry one another, the white race is gone. Um, always, I don't have time to talk about this very much, but always beneath the racial fears are, is, is sexuality. So what the Republicans do is they just decide enough. We're, we don't need these, we're the majority party. And they just, they just close, they just stop fighting uh, the racial wars. In American historiography, this is known as the nadir 
of black politics. African Americans are left all alone. Nobody's going to support black uh, people. It's a brutal period. It's not that there weren't lots of politics and lots of uh, culture war. It's that no party took part in it. And just as that, that's the uh, that's that's the first second paragraph of this guy's inaugural address right after Roosevelt. And shortly thereafter, immigration gets shut down. I said that the United States was a nation of immigrant, but not after 1924. Look at this. One point two million immigrants in 1907. Just in that year, 23,000. When Franklin Roosevelt is beginning the New Deal, the immigrants are gone. And so the great two great culture wars, race and immigration disappear, not from American politics, but from American parties. Keeping track of this time here. And then, and I'm coming to the heart of my talk now, um, the, the pattern changes. So from no culture war, something very dramatic happens. African-Americans moving north, Jacob Lawrence, the great migration, had always voted Republicans, had always voted for Republicans. There had been uh, uh, 22, I think, black members elected to the House of Representatives to this point, every single one of them uh, a Republican. And in 1932, that black vote began to move to the Democrats that had enough of being um, forgotten by the Republicans. And in 1936, for the first time, the black vote is slightly more Democratic than Republican. The newspapers are full of scorn. Don't they understand this is the party of segregation? Don't they understand all the senior members in this party are white supremacists? These black people write the newspapers, just don't understand what they're doing. The two million black people who've moved to the North and get to vote. Um, and in fact, many social scientists write about this was a crazy time where, uh, where the politics is driven by white supremacy and somehow the blacks go into the wrong political party. But by 1948, there's a battle over control for the, of the Democratic Party. And what happens? By 1948, the Democrats have a civil rights plank in their national convention. The white supremacists troop out. The battle continues over, within the Democratic Party, Republicans sitting on the sidelines till 1964. And then the contemporary uh, politics goes into place. The Northern Republicans were contesting the black vote. They needed it to, 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 stay in, to stay in power. They needed to keep it. Democrats making great inroads. And then in 1964, oh, I don't have a picture of him, Barry Goldwater, a genuine, honest, unracist conservative runs for wins the nomination for president. And at his convention, there's what could only be called a festival of racism. This is Jackie Robinson, a Republican, famous baseball player. He writes in the, um, in the black press that I knew what it was like to be a Jew in Nazi Germany by sitting in that convention. The N-word rang around at all the black delegates, horrific stories. So here's what we have a genuine, honest conservative in Goldwater and his followers. They're libertarians, true blue libertarians, but they look the other way as deep racists crawl into the coalition with them and give it a lot of its juice. This coalition gets locked into place when one of Nixon's advisors, a guy named Kevin Phillips, says to Nixon, stop resisting black voters. The more blacks vote, the more they'll vote for Democrats, and the more whites will flee the Democratic Party. And that's what Nixon does. He pushes voting for just that reason. And what we have is a change in the two parties. By 1972, uh, with the exception of Jimmy Carter in 76, uh, but um, the white vote never again votes Democratic. This is the presidential elections whites become Republicans. Some, of course, out of pure conservative principle, others are uh, not feeling so good about civil rights. Uh, so look at that, Around the average, this average comes out to 39% uh, of the vote. Meanwhile, the African-American vote is somewhere like 88% of, um, of the Democratic, uh, uh, 
88% Democratic. Well, at first, now, at first, this is no problem for reasons I'll give you in a second. But before I go to that, I have to bring in immigration. Very casually in 1964, without hearings or much thought at all, the Democrats, that's Lyndon Johnson, opened the doors to immigration. Number of people born abroad had been plummeting. And all of a sudden they said, it's not gonna change much. Well, 59 million people later, it's changed a lot. So the immigration opens at the same time as the civil rights politics is heating up. But notice this time immigration is written as a civil rights policy. Suddenly we have one party that's a coalition and for the first time in American history of all the so-called minorities. The Asian American vote is the last one to go. As late as 2000, it's deeply Republican. And then after 9-11, it goes into the Democrats' hands. African American, Black vote, yep. Uh, uh, Latino vote could be changing, but here's Here's the Joe Biden votes, just to let you know how it goes with the historical pattern. I've given you two different, these numbers are a little fuzzy, so I've given you the, the range of, uh, of, uh, of estimates for the, uh, for the Biden vote. But nevertheless, what we have is a party of black, Latino, Asian, and some whites, and a party of whites. About 88% on average in this period, 1972 to 2000, 88% of the vote for the Republican party is white. It's a white party. And so we've got this setup where one of the, where the parties themselves are set up to mainstream the two culture wars because it's no longer split up. One party is the party of African Americans and immigrants. And uh oh, the white vote starts to fall. The estimates are different, but the slope is undeniable. Or to put it differently in 2005, the Census Bureau comes out with a finding that by the year 2050, whites will be in a minority. Well, that is a recipe for getting people nervous. Indeed, for children under 16, it's happened in 2019. It's happening faster than people expected. Uh, less than 50% of the children under 16 are white. So I, I wonder if there's any other uh, country where the majority ethnic group has or any other democracy has turned into a minority, not lost power, but turned into a minority. I can't think of any, and I'd be very, uh, very grateful if you could think of any, uh, but that's often said in the United States. It's a rare, a rare event. And they just see the two parties, see things so differently. Just look at this one. Uh, is it more difficult to be a black person in America? Three out of four Democrats, oh yeah. Less than one out of 10 Republicans and so on and so forth for any racial thing you've got. And so there's the, there's the, um, there's the story in a nutshell. The Republicans are the white native party. The Demo Not only, of course, there's lots of honest conservative Republicans saying, we don't care about this stuff, but they're in a coalition. Democrats include not only whites, but black, Latino, Asian, and in a changing demography. I don't really have time to talk about this, but apartheid societies make it really important to control sexuality. And so there's lots and lots of sexual politics in the United States. When you read about sexual politics in the United States, think, yeah, that is reflects all this uh, demographic, uh, demographic fear. There's one last thing I need to talk about. I'm at 30 minutes, so I, I need to, to conclude, but let me just say, inequality, this is giving, driving all, this is the Gini index, lots of different ways of measuring it. So uh, the, the numbers vary by whose, whose Gini index you look at, but the Gini index named after an uh, Italian economist that multiplied by 100. Basically, zero, uh, uh, one would be that uh, uh, Karthik has all the money and we have nothing. And 100 is complete equality. Uh, I'm sorry, I just, I just reversed that. 100 is complete inequality. Uh, one is uh, complete inequality. I did it wrong again. Uh, I'm gonna take an extra three minutes, okay? <sighs> okay, the lower you are, the more egalitarian. Uh, notice the United Kingdom there in 1970, but notice more interestingly, for those of, study, of us who study the United States, the United States is a European country, a little behind Japan, a little bit behind Sweden, 10% behind Sweden, and ahead of France. You wanna compare it to Mexico, um, this is why England, I believe, was uh, so egalitarian in 1970. That's where the bombs fell in London. Now let's look at it 
on the latest data, um, everybody else has held pretty steady since 1970. Indeed, most countries have actually become more egalitarian. That's not true for the last 15 years, but it is true uh, since 1970, except, my God, look at that number. Uh, by the way, England as well, you can't have that level of inequality roiling through a society without creating lots of dislocations. By the way, now that we're in England for a moment, you gotta notice the similarities between our countries, the Gini index, the foreign board population, and the sometimes leaders that come along. Um, uh, well, you'll recognize them all, of course. Uh, so in sum, got there, huh? Uh, in sum, the parties in the past diffused American culture wars. They, as I've said, race and immigration went in different parties and each party embraced the different liminal group. Now parties mainline the culture conflict. All the minorities are on one side and party leaders caught in very close elections have all the incentive to stoke the fears. Um, surveys really pick up this tension as I've shown you. And the um, anti government itself is part of what is seen as a problem in, um, in, in, in the Republican Party, partially because it has conservatives, but partially because government is seen as helping um, those people, the other people. Second, secure the vote. The, the most surprising thing, or one of the most surprising things, as I did my historical account, was that there's no right to vote in the United States. Uh, for example, back in 1800, that election I was uh, sort of swamped down in for a while, seven of the 16 states that existed then changed the rules. They changed the rules so the majority would have an easier time winning. So if you want to understand American politics, one thing you have to understand is every election begins with a battle over the rules or 50 battles over the rules in 50 different states. And then you have the election. And if there's one reform I'd have for the United States, which would calm all this down, is just secure the rules. I don't care what they are, just agree on them and stop fighting over them. In fact, I was lucky enough to interview Barack Obama for my next book. And this is what he pointed out. He's just the, you know, let's get a set of rules and agree on them. You know, Obama, the old constitutional expert. So that's the imperative. I'm going to move a little bit to something more positive. You know, I've been talking about a lot of change between the parties. Change is a constant, and you see it all the time. So don't get too comfortable with any view of politics. This is probably true in all countries, but it's definitely true in the United States, and you can see it most clearly in the youngest generations. When I look at my students, I think, well, it's hard not to have hope. They've got such good values. You know, People say, well, public opinion changed in the United States finally over same-sex marriage. No, it didn't. A whole new generation came online, online and they were totally for same-sex marriage. The grumpy old people, my age, they haven't changed very much. They've sort of gone along with it. But the public opinions cha uh, changed because this young generation, the new generation, voters really under 35, have very different perspectives. And when I stop and think, change is constant. It's always happening. We've got a whole new generation coming into, coming into the office, uh, coming, into, coming online. Um, that gives you some hope for the future. I was going to say, let me give one last anecdote. Don't I have time. I'm sorry for this. I'm got, I've gone over a little bit, but this is my last, my last point. And I, again, it's made best, I think, with an anecdote. We don't tend to see what's happening down in the community level. I've talked only about power at the highest levels, the presidency. During the AIDS crisis, terrible a moment uh, in the early 1980s, uh, in the mid 1980s, we didn't know how you got it, how it was transmitted. I went and visited a, um, an pediatric AIDS clinic on this street. It was a, a very poor street in Newark, New Jersey. And I interviewed the brother who ran this clinic. Let's call him Brother Terry. And um, he told me the following story. He said that the three days before they were set to open the painting and they're going to have a big open house for the children. And um, the doorbell rings and there's this handsome man standing outside. And uh, the guy says, is this the AIDS house? And, and Brother said, uh, Terry says, you have a pediatric AIDS clinic. Yes, it is. And the guy says, it's just fair to warn you that I'm the uh, selectman for this ward and I'm going to shut you down. 
And Brother Terry says, why? And the guy says, we don't need AIDS in Newark, New Jersey. Brother Terry said, I lost my temper. I showed him a house across the street. He said, there's a shooting gallery. People are doing crack there. Why don't you shut them down? He says, I know, I know. Newark, New Jersey, what is it? It's crack. And now you're going to make AIDS. Brother, look there. The one business in the street, a Tasty Freeze. When parents know the kids have to walk past your AIDS house to get to the Tasty Freeze, that guy's going to come and complain to me, and I'm going to use his complaint to shut you down. Off he goes. The day before the opening, here comes the guy, rings the doorbell, opens the door, the guy from the Tasty Freeze. So is this the AIDS house? Is this the pediatrics aid clinic? Yes, says Brother Terry. Yes, it is. And the guy says, I'm, and he's got a Tasty Freeze uniform on his Tasty Freeze. And he says, um, you know what? I, I, I was thinking I could bring you ice cream for the kids on your open house tomorrow. Uh, if you like that, I'll just come and take orders, milkshakes, whatever they want, floats, whatever they want. Brother Terry says, yeah, that would be great. It would be really nice. Can I ask you why you're doing this? And the guy says, yeah. Yeah, I had a brother who got AIDS and I told my kids, you stay away from him, he's a sinner. And then he died. And then the preacher says at, ch at, at church that Jesus hugged the leper. And I thought, oh my God, I should have hugged my brother. Now I can't bring him back, but I can help you. I'm gonna stand by you. Brother told, Terry told me person after person came out from the streets and said, how can I help with a similar story? Now, if you go back and look at the newspapers or the magazines from the 1980s, what you'll hear is the underclass and how desperate these people are in Newark, New Jersey, but there in the level of community, something was stirring, something powerful. And I think it made a difference eventually. And in American national politics, communities pulled together in ways that we don't see till much later on. And so I end with this Brother Terry story, although I could have been boring and just said, that's what Tocqueville said. And that's probably a pretty good place to stop. So thank you. These are my books, but that's, uh, that's Karthik. <laughs> stop my clock. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. You're such an engaging speaker that I abrogated my moderator duties. And, oh, thank you for uh, letting went, me go on and, and, and on, and went, stuck and there. And... But, but this is our chance to take questions from the group. So if you have questions, uh, you also have the uh, opportunity to ask questions if you're online. I've got an iPad here that will tell me what the questions are. But um, I'll open it up to the group. And whilst we wait for the first question, I wondered, uh -huh. Um, what, to what extent did, does uh, what you describe as sort of, you know, fears around race and fears around immigration, are they mnemonics for sort of broken social promises? And, and when people resort now back to racial identities, it's because they see the social contract as not having delivered. Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, race, of course, is an explanatory variable that doesn't suggest it's a causal variable, mm. um, but it's, it's, it's people using it as a helpful mnemonic for broken social promises. And this may be sort of connected to your point about inequality. Mm. And that's the great question. And one that we talk about all the time in American politics. Mm. Um, how much of it is, um, how much of it is really a broken system where people are just left behind and how much of it is raw race? So, uh, or slightly differently, how much of it is teleological and how much of it is instrumental? Yeah, and, and I think the answer is both. You know, I think all, all uh, social welfare societies have to define who the us is, who the society is. And if you have... I'm going to verge dangerously close to 1619 territory. But if you have a society that was organized around slavery, when both North and South, it's not like the North got off scot-free, there's this huge economy, that the very definition of your society is organized around the race line. So if you're Black, it's organized around being this sort of biblical children of God that's been excluded from this, from this bad country. And if you're white, your very definition of freedom is organized around the race line. I think, I think that lasts a long time. Now, there are a lot of social scientists who say we can overcome it only with, just as you suggest, 
with universal kind of policies by making uh, social mobility, I went past that slide, making the promise of social mobility real, we can get past this, but it's a lot to get past. Um, and then we get to the instrumental. You're a politician caught in a close election and you've got this nuclear bomb that works and people have had a very hard time resisting it over time because it's such an effective bomb. Mm. So yes to both these, this is really quite intricate. So divided society and the temptation to use those divisions. You know, it's often just as one last point about it. When I study civil rights in the 30s and 40s and 50s in the South, I always wonder what would have happened if a generation of white leaders had come along in the South and said, you know what, this is BS. Let's get beyond it. We can mainstream our whole society. And the answer is a lot of them tried and they were defeated because the call to race was so powerful. It's not that they weren't good liberals trying or relative liberals trying, they just lost. And so the instrumental temptation, the temptation to use that instrumentally is just overwhelming and in very close elections. So, you know, if you want to, if either the Republicans or the Democrats became the dominant party, you might find much less of this because people would not use such scurrilous tactics, mm. but they work, they're powerful. And so they do. Mm. Very interesting. Yep. And just introduce yourself, oh, Melissa, yeah. briefly as well. Hi, yeah. I'm Melissa. I'm an MPP student uh -huh. here at Bobotnik. Um, just to kind of build on that a little bit, uh, Heather McGee talks a little bit about how racist policies in the U.S. are, are posed as a zero-sum game. I think you could say immigration is as well. And I think it stokes the fear and the further division. How, how do we overcome that? How do we get people to feel like if you win, it doesn't take something from me or it doesn't, you know, my status is not eroded. My class is not eroded. And I think it's so pervasive. I don't, I'd love to hear yes. your thoughts. No, that's a really good question. And one hope has to be with the young generation of Republicans. So I meet with my Republican students and I say, look, there's this coalition. And I know you hate the race part of it. If you made a real effort to go into the Latino and the black and the Asian communities to say, look, we have an idea, um, not an idea I agree with, but many people do, that the libertarian policies will actually help you. And really went after those voters that as they came into your coalition, they would press you just as the black vote did to the Democrats uh, between 1930 and the 1960s, um, it would push the Republicans to put aside that racial, the racial demons and rather make their argument on the things that are uh, uh, honorable, like their idea of freedom, their idea of religion, not everybody agrees with it, but still that's their view, uh, their ideas of less regulation and lower taxes and, and more business. Um, more not woke business. There's my partner, Rebecca, who would have something to say about this. So I think one key is Republicans themselves and really the younger generation of Republicans. Now, Democrats could do something by saying, look at that inequality data. And part of the explanation for the inequality data is we're getting a lot of money from high financiers. Um, they could begin to think, how do we really attack uh, inequality? That is, how do we go into the great parts of the country that are pure red, far away from the cities, and think, let's have a serious rural policy. It's not going to work in three or five years, but over time it would work. This would again tend to diminish this. And I actually believe it will diminish over the next 10 years, not over if we can survive the next four to eight years. <laughs> so each party has things they could do. Oh, but it's so tempting to just hit this nuclear button and fight the way they've been fighting. And if you only think two years out, it's very hard to, to not do it that way. But yes, it doesn't have to be zero sum. Excellent. Uh, did you have a question, Kevin? Yeah, yeah. Right, so go ahead. Um, I'm also an MPP student. Um, I guess I'd be just curious to hear a little bit more about um, how media fits into your sort of account, particularly how media has changed over time. And since, like, right now we're seeing, for example, like Fox News commentators like saying to like 
Governor Greg Abbott that he's not doing enough to sort of militarize the southern border and him having to respond with more even more extreme policies around immigration and just how media has changed over time and how that either fuels or uh, sort of mitigates these tensions and what might need to change if we want to yes. have a better deal with Yeah, that's a really good question. It's one of my the five usual explanations. Um, Fox News um, and, and sort of whole media thing. My reading of media history goes like this, that every time there's a, a new media, it's the Wild West all over again. When the, when the cheap newspapers came in, they were incredible. They call them yellow, yellow rags, but the penny newspapers, it was crazy. And, uh, you know, the uh, Spanish-American War, garrulous war, um, the, the pay, it was driven by the new mass newspapers, like was when radio came in. You know, there were, there were absolute racists on the radio. And each time what happened over time, Americans found ways to uh, regulate the new media. But each one was very disruptive. Um, and, and, you know, in England, it's interesting. In England, they said, oh, my God, radio and television could be so disruptive. Let's make the major uh, uh, voices on it government itself, because we, we know it'll just be populist mayhem. If you look at the Europeans, they all let government dominate the voice, not the Americans. Although the Americans came to regulate radio and television very heavily. Um, up until the Reagan administration when it was when it was deregulated. So in my optimistic moments, I say it's this this is a radically new media and we don't have our hands around it. But if 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 um, if I were a, a crazy right wing Republican and Karthik was a crazy Democrat and we were both in the Senate, the one thing we could agree on is Zuckerberg really stinks. I mean, we just agree on that. And I see um, a real opportunity, if they can ever get anything done, to begin to put limitations and regulations and maybe even antitrust on new forms of media. It's one of the very few things left and right agree on. So I think I see the old history repeating itself, which is at first the Great Wild West, followed by more careful controls until a more responsible use of the media takes place. And Generally, what it means is getting away from the extremes and more towards a reflection of, of what most people want, really want out of their politics. That's the optimistic view. And it may be that politics is so broken that they won't be able to do anything. And this will really be different. But every time you hear this time, it's different. You, you got to take it with a grain of salt. So I'll be optimistic and say, I think they'll eventually regulate the new media. Huge effect in the short run, but that's nothing new for a new media. So we have a comment more than a question from David Morrow, who's an MPP student online. He says, um, Northern Ireland is an example of a state where a majority has become a minority and our politics is similarly divided. Oh, that's a good state. example. Thank you, David. That's a really good example. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's an example where a majority has become a minority. Uh, but again, um, I didn't say this. It was in my notes, so I should have. That essential point about any functioning democracy is you have lots of cross-cutting cleavages that economic interests sort of make all kinds of strange bedfellows that depending on what the vote is, you'll have a different coalition. The most famous writing about American politics ever written, Madison's 10 Federals, basically says that. Uh, the vote today is different from the vote tomorrow. So as long as you have lots of different interests, you'll have uh, no incentive to tyrannize. And it was often, uh, American political scientists always chuckle at the poor benighted other countries um, like India or Ireland, where it was all Irish versus Catholic or Hindu versus Muslim. Um, and we're not chuckling anymore. Uh, when you stop having cross-cutting cleavages, that's when you run into trouble. Um, and although I said majority, minority, I mean, a lot of the coming minority, have to have a majority going into the minority. I mean, in India, 79% Hindu, and yet the Hindus feel put upon by the Muslims, by this minority. But it gets even worse, I think, in the United States as the numbers go down. My reading, and, and uh, David and others will know more about this than I do, but my reading of Northern Ireland is at long last, the, it's, always, it's always Catholic versus Protestant. 
is beginning to diminish. And we're seeing other cleavages develop exactly as you'd expect in a well-functioning democracy. So we've still got this difference. You still got the problems of North versus South, but it seems less so now. Like people are interested in getting wealthy. Um, and that's sort of a very different thing in both the North and the South. So I end up being pretty optimistic about Ireland, um, maybe a little more so than the United States, because they're coming back to that essential feature of democracy, cross-cutting cleavages. But thank you for that example. That's great. I will go back and, and, uh, and blast Americans who say we're the first ones to ever do that. It's a typical American thing to say. <laughs> but maybe it can be the next book. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, well, pepper. pepper. So how would you say that Northern Ireland is uh, not yet a state? So, uh, um, so that, that's, <laughs> that's right, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my question is, um, you said the names uh, Adams and Jefferson more than you said the name Trump. Um, and so your story is a very uh, structural story, right? Uh, there are these, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's race and immigration and then they're separated and then they're sort of taken out of party competition and then it happens uh, and it's just inevitable what was going to happen. Uh, and so I wonder if you could talk about the extent to which the perils of American democracy right now uh, are tied to specificities about Donald Trump, uh, or is your view that were there not Donald Trump, someone just like Donald Trump, we'll call him Donald DeSantis, could have you know come in and done the same thing? Uh, uh, uh. Um, so, 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 what role does the individual play as opposed to the right. structure? And as a good social scientist, you know, never, never quarter someone into being determinist, right? There's always choice and contingency playing. But I'll say this. Um, that if you, um, if you remember the table of the white vote as it went down, when Ronald Reagan ran for president, 88% uh, of the electorate is white. And remember, the white vote has now fled the Democratic Party. It's about 60% Republican. Reagan could be completely genial. A few little winks to the, re to the segregationists was all he needed to do. As long as you had this preponderant vote, but as it went down, the winks and the whistles got louder and louder. Um, so by the time you get to 2012 and 2016 and 2020, that white vote is really low. And what that means is that Democrats are winning. The Republicans have won a, a popular majority once since 1988 in the presidential election. So the, uh, that's 2004 for George Bush. The electoral college has made it more complicated, but anybody who's running understands that. Um, the Romneys who run and so forth. So yes, you have contingency. A perfectly decent person might run, not an untrump. But what they're gonna find is that it's hard going. They can't just do a little wink to the white population to keep them in line. They need to squeeze that population to make up for their shrinking white base. What was there for the taking was what Trump saw, which I'm going to use a bullhorn to get that last white vote. And by golly, it worked. Now, he didn't win a majority. He lost by three million votes, but he managed to squeeze that vote. And it's going to have to be more. That white vote has gone down another 2% of the population since the last election. And if these numbers stay where they are, uh, holding constant are the two exchanges over here that the parties change and go in a different direction, it will be harder and harder for the white majority party to win that. So it's a combination of a structural situation that incentivizes certain kinds of behavior. So I think the Trumps will likely be followed by one of two things, enlightened Republicans who say, you know what, we can get that Latino vote. We're really gonna go after, we can even get some of the black vote. We're really gonna go after that. It probably will take a while, but that could happen. It's just a lot harder a lift than simply squeezing. And that's the structural situation enabled to Trump is how I would put it. Does that make get me out of contingency, Pepper? Does that enter contingency into it? <laughs> So good, your great question. No, that is a really good question. We're, Thank we you. Are, we're coming close to the end. Oh of no! Time. Sorry, um, I'll give we, shorter answers. We, no, we will. We will uh, have chance for people in the room to ask uh, Professor Marone questions over drinks outside. We're going to ask one last question, which is: um, the vast majority of our students uh, are from outside the United yes. States. They, um, uh, in fact. 
come from 110 different countries and counting. And currently we have two alums who are running for heads of state in their respective countries. Oh. So what advice based on your long career of, of studying what countries? American... Uh, uh, Never what, mind. What, what advice based on your long career of studying uh, American democracy um, would you give them on how to deal with the coming America? Oh, you t- sent that in a different twist. Yeah. Not giving them advice about their own country. No, no, that's no. A, yeah. uh, that's a, ah, oh, hang up. Uh, yes, and I have to apologize. I know you guys are used to seeing uh, uh, politics and and society and culture from across the world. And here the American comes and only wants to talk about America. And I, I am, I am a, a little bashful about that. Um, but I think um, there are two Americas and one America looks abroad with great anticipation and wants those connections. Many people look at international healthcare systems to take just one example and says, if only we could import what they do in France, what they do in Germany, uh, what they do in Switzerland, which uses markets all over the place. Uh, England is a big a bit of a stretch. And again and again, we study uh, international systems, Japan or Taiwan, and, we, and we're eager. And that America is an America that's very eager to engage. The, the America of Barack Obama, one that is somewhat humble about America's role in the world and one that needs encouragement. The other America isn't like that. It used to be said uh, among the reporters that if you don't get your dispatch in uh, for the news deadlines on the East Coast, don't bother with the international news because no one else cares. Um, That's a bit of an exaggeration now, but there is another America. My overwhelming advice is there are two Americas in a tight contest and you can help by engaging one. It'll be so tempting to simply say, ah, it's just an unreliable country. First George Bush, now Donald Trump. It's just an unreliable walk away. But it's as the same way you'd engage with Iran. There are liberals in Iran wanting to engage the world and there are others wanting to not engage the world. The United States, kind of like Iran. And we need help from you. So engage us. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. I did get a lot of questions. Yes, sorry. There are drinks outside.